The Gospel According to Matthew. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is good news for us. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace is yours through our risen Christ. Amen. Our next door neighbors built, bought their house several months before they moved into it. And every time they would come down to check on the renovations, invariably they would leave the switch on for their outside spotlights. Now these were motion lights, and so every time the breeze would blow the little crepe myrtle underneath the light, the lights would go on and off. And since that light happened to be on the side of the house where our bedroom is, you can imagine what that was like. It didn't seem to bother me. I mean, you sleep with your eyes closed, but it drove Susan crazy. And she didn't get a whole lot of sleep. And so, we got curtains to make sure the room was dark. But, thinking about that reminds me that just a little bit of light can ruin the darkness. I brought this little tiny spoon with me this morning. It uh, sits on the counter beside, right beside our stove, and it's used for salt. I guess that's about how much a pinch of salt is. But it's amazing that it just takes a little bit of salt to enrich a dish. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus did not say you ought to be light and salt. He did not say you're supposed to be light and salt. He also did not say you could be light and salt if you just tried a little harder. No. Jesus said, you are light and salt. Jesus is describing what we already are. And it doesn't take but just a little bit to make a lot of difference. 
We are still in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' teaching, the longest and largest section of teaching in all of the Gospels. And all throughout this teaching, Jesus is describing what the kingdom of God looks like and how the kingdom of God shapes the world. And constantly throughout this teaching, Jesus is trying to get his hearers, and that would include us, he's trying to get us to understand what kingdom life looks like and how kingdom people are supposed to live. And today, he says, we're supposed to live, you have to live better than all the religious folks. You mean to be salt and light? We have to be better than the Pharisees? Yep. Only it might not be exactly what you think. The Pharisees are kind of always thought of as being the bad guys in Jesus' story, mainly because they're always at odds with what Jesus is doing. They always seem to disagree with how he looks at things and what he is teaching. They disagree what kingdom life is supposed to be. Now to the Pharisees, the law was life itself. And that means they believed that the law needed to be lived out perfectly. And in order to do that, they sort of insulated the law with a long list of rules and regulations designed to tell you exactly what you're supposed to do to live out this law. In other words, there's the law, and then all of these things that you have to do to keep it. But the fact is, that long list of rules and regulations meant that it, it became impossible to live out that law. Or, or it even became impossible to know if you had done it or not. Now they looked at Jesus as somebody who just disregarded that list of rules and regulations. That he just wasn't playing by the rules. But Jesus says very clearly today, he did not come to do away with the law. What I'm doing, he says, is I'm trying to help you see and understand what the law really means and what it's really all about. I want you to understand that that God's kingdom is not just a lot of religious scorekeeping. And so if your life gets caught up in trying to figure out what's wrong and what's right and who's in and who's out, then you're going to miss out on the kind of life God wants you to have. Your understanding of God is way too small. And it's too restricting. I'm here to show you how to participate in what God is doing in this world. I'm here to help you be who you are. Light and salt. Now Jesus says that light and salt are useless unless they are used for what they're intended to be used for. We talk about a run-on sentence. If light and salt are not used as they're intended, they're useless. And the word he uses for useless is the Greek word moronos. It's where we get the word moron or fool. He says it's foolish if you don't use these things the way they're intended. If you've got a salt shaker sitting right beside 
your stove and you never shake the salt into the dish, why do you have it there to begin with? If you've got a light and then you cover it up with a basket, you might as well not have lit in the light in the first place. Lit in the light. You might as well not have lighted the light. Sometimes the tongue gets faster than the brain. Sorry about that. But the fact is, it's foolish if you don't use these things the way they were intended to be used. And so Jesus is saying, if you're going to be a part of what God is up to in this world, then you have to do what you've been made to do. And if not, then you're not going to experience life the way God wants you to experience it. You're not going to understand and, and, and be a part of what life is like in the kingdom. Now, I think I like the place where Jesus describes us as salt the best. Because when he calls us salt, he's really telling us how valuable we are. Really. As Mark Kurlansky says in his book, Salt, a world history from the beginning of civilization until about 100 years ago salt was one of the most sought after commodities in human history the ancients believed that salt could ward off evil spirits contracts were sealed with salt Salt was used for medicinal purposes. It was used to disinfect wounds and treat skin diseases. Salt was mixed with soil as the first fertilizer to enhance the soil's properties and help the crops grow. Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. That's where we get our English word salary. And the Romans made a habit of salting their vegetables the way we do in our salads. And of course, before there was refrigeration, salt was absolutely essential for food preservation. Now, we could buy salt for pennies. And so to be thought of as salt may not seem like a whole lot, but imagine what it must have been like to hear that in Jesus' day. To be told that you are invaluable. For Jesus to say that we are essential to life and that by our very presence... We bring healing. We make things better. That's amazing. But there's also a caution that comes with this. As Pastor Debbie Thomas says, Jesus' words are not just meant as a compliment. They're also a caution. Salt can be healing, but too much salt in our bodies can kill us. Salt enhances flavor, but it can also ruin a dish. Salt brings about growth, but laws had to be passed against people ruining their enemy's fields by pouring salt into the dirt. We are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. That is what we are. But being who we are can be both enhancing or it can embitter. It can soothe or it can irritate. It can heal or it can kill. 
for better or worse. What we do with our saltiness matters. And it matters a lot. Whether we know it or not, whether we mean to or not, whether we are intentional about it or not, what we do changes and affects our world and those around us. And how we choose to do that affects how we experience God's kingdom among us and how others experience that kingdom in their life too. Jesus says salt is only useless when it's not being used. And so our value, our value, is seen as we apply our saltiness with kindness, with generosity, to be a preservative, to be a healing presence, to be life enhancing. When we try to apply it otherwise, it can be damaging and hurtful. But Jesus says we are the salt of the earth to be those who heal. And it only takes a little to make a big difference. Pastor Dennis Snobley said, that he was really excited when he found out that, that a world-famous theologian was going to come and make a presentation at his seminary. He was really excited and, and, and anxious to hear this great wisdom that this person could impart. But he said that that was not what affected him from the event. What affected him the most is what happened in a brief encounter in the bathroom when he ran into the speaker. And a few words were exchanged, but great wisdom was given as he watched this world-famous leader bend down and pick up the stray towels, paper towels that had been left on the floor and place them in the trash can. That small act of selfless service is what made such a huge impact on Pastor Snively. Because giving of himself humbly made this world-famous leader even more credible. Constantly, repeatedly, Jesus teaches the value of simple, humble service. The kind that would allow someone to forget one's position to help another. Just cleaning up after someone who is less thoughtful can be a pinch of salt. It can make a huge difference for someone else. It doesn't take a lot to make life better. But it doesn't stop there. It can start there, it should start there, but it doesn't stop there. Because our world is deeply wounded. We know that. We know how wounded it is and all the sweet and, and sugary remedies that the world wants is doing little to heal it. So sometimes we have to show the world how deep its wounds are. We have to rub salt into those wounds even if it stings. We have to be those who lift up those who have been beaten down by the world's cruelty. The prophet Isaiah said, it's not enough to fast and be religious. 
In other words, it's not enough to be nice people and go to church. What God wants is people who will take care of the downtrodden, the hungry, the naked, and the homeless. Then, Isaiah says, then the dawn of God's light will rise like a new day. Isaiah is talking about big things here. Greed and oppression and working to provide the basic human needs of clothing and food and shelter for all people. And our hearts begin to yearn for this new day dawning as we begin with small things, as we begin to see how that saltiness can take effect and change us and change others. Because we are then moved to do something about the wounds that surround all of us. Those little pinches of salt add up. The smallest bit of light ruins the darkness. The more we give both to the world, the more the good news of God's kingdom breaks forth. God is not through with this old world because God is not through with us. God will use us to help heal the world when we live out who we are, the salt and the light of Christ. Please pray with me. Loving God, you know us and remind us of who we are, those whom you love, salt, and light. Help us to be salt for the world's wounds and light for its darkness, that your kingdom may come and your will be done here and now. In Christ we pray. Amen.